Thank you. Chosen to worship with us this evening. And we ask that if you are visiting with us, please fill out a attendance card that's located in the back of the pew and leave it on the pew. That way we have a record of your visits. And we ask that uh, everyone please turn off your cell phone, place it on mute in order not to disturb the worship service. Also, if you have need of a training room or nursery, we have those rooms available. Just exit the auditorium, turn to your left, and your rooms will be off to your left. Please keep our members, loved ones, in your prayers. Buck Chavin is at home, but he must be on oxygen, and he is not feeling very well. Josephine Spears' brother-in-law, Kent, is in the ICU, is on a ventilator. And Delphine Hopkins uh, is traveling. Also, Monica McLean Brindridge and her son Derek is also traveling. So please keep them in prayer. Also, I have a note here for Beverly, Sister Patsy. Uh, she's having surgery on her neck. So please keep her in prayer as well. And our other announcements uh, come join us on Wednesday. Our monthly singing night will be at 7 p.m. Youth Devotional, uh, join us Sunday, July 9th, following the evening worship in the fellowship hall. And please bring finger foods. We are having a baby shower. Ladies, please join us for a baby shower honoring Hannah Fain, Sunday, July 16th, from 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. It's in the fellowship hall. Hannah is having a girl and is requesting baby clothes, blankets, socks, diapers size one and two, and wipes. Our 2023 BBS, put on your whole armor of God, Ephesians chapter six, verses 10 through 18. Join us for the BBS beginning, beginning July 23rd, July 26th. Please sign up on the bulletin board to teach and help. There will be a teacher's meeting following the morning service on Sunday, July 19th. If you talk, if you talk last BBS, we wish to, and wish to teach this year, please attend a sign up help and invite and attend. If you wish to donate, please see Zach Batiste and Lee Fisher. I'd like to encourage anyone who uh, would like to teach, please uh, sign up and uh, meet with the elders as well. Sunday Glen Children Home Drive, we are collecting the following items through July 9th. Pine Saw, Mr. Clean, Fabulosa, Uggies, Diapers, ages uh, six, five and six, and sweet cereals. The items may be placed in the foyer. School Supply Drive, we are collecting school supplies through August 6th. These items can be placed in the foyer. Ladies Outing, the latest outing for the Planetarium has been rescheduled tentatively for July the 12th. The cost is $7 per person. For more information, please see Lois Brown. Ladies t shirts. Yeah, it is a good hour, right? So please see Lois Brown. Ladies t shirts. Ladies, if you did not order a t shirt on the last order, no worries. Please give your size to Alfredo Petway, and we will place an order ordering during the next sale. Are there any more announcements? The order of our worship this evening is first prayer will be Andre Petway, song leader will be Galen Williams, scripture reader will be Sean Maldonado, sermon will be by Phil McIntosh, communion offering will be Ivan McIntosh and Jonathan Smith, Closing prayer will be by Patrick Sellers. Let us begin with prayer. Now we're about. Father, thank you for sustaining our lives so that we can come back out and worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask that our worship tonight will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Father, we pray for our political leaders, Lord, who are leading us in offices throughout the land. We ask that 
guide them to make decisions in accordance with your word and protect us from them when they make decisions against your guidance. We ask, Father, that when decisions are made against guidance from the Bible, we'll stand firm, still obey you, and obey your words so that we may remain in good standing eternally with you. Pray for every household here, especially in the church, that you protect all marriages, all parents who are trying to and are doing raising their children in accordance with your word. Protect our children, protect our grandchildren, and all those generations behind us so that they will always be faithful to your word. Father, we thank you for Brother Phil and his family. We ask that when he imparts tonight, will help us to get closer to you. And we pray that it will be edifying, build us up, and encourage us to teach others and that, that which he imparts blessing. Give us of our sins, Lord, and we ask that you always protect us from fire regards of sin. We ask this prayer and any other blessings of the Son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Good evening. Good evening. First song be hymn number two. Hymn number two. You have it? Let us see. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in a place where rings of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in a place that shadows a dry place in land. He and God will see there with his hands. And God will be there with his hands. Oh, wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taken my burden away. He holds with me up and I shall be. He gives me strength as my day. He hides. The of the rock that shadows of the of the with numberless blessings, each moment he crowns, and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, glory to God, for such a redeemer as mine. He hides the plants of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hides and God was be there with his hand. And God was be there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transformed in our pride to be in the clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation is wonderful. How shall I with the millions on high? He has that shadows of my thirsty land. He has been down to his heart. And God was in the wickedness of the And God was in the wickedness of the Good evening. Good evening. 
For this evening's scripture, I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 8 through 13. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what, what things ye need ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, thee, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed by thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts, and as we forget, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen. If you'd like to mark the song of invitation, it'll be hymn number 109. 109 will be the song of invitation. Song before our lesson will be hymn number 406. 406. You have it. Let us see. Some glad morning when this life is over, I fly away to come on God's election show. I fly away. I fly away to glory. I fly away. When I die, I live in the shadows of the sun, I I can make you one promise this evening, and that is this lesson will not last for an hour and a half. <clears throat> I want to mention some numbers to you. Maybe you're not a numbers person. But if we find enough different things to discuss, then surely we'll have everybody somewhere. Some people like numbers, some people like history, some people like language. Eventually, we'll get everybody. Now, you might not be included in these numbers. You have possibly made better decisions than around you. You may have been very greatly blessed by God and have made good decisions with the blessings that God has given you. But most likely, the average American is included in these numbers. According to bankrate.com, now this is not, for what I understand, an 
indictment or accusation against individual people of irresponsibility, but that uh, it is simply the, the average that exists among those uh, who have been polled and who fit within the category. And that is the average American holds a debt balance of just over $96,000. For the website debt.org, the total amount that Americans owe on credit cards is $986 billion. Almost $12 trillion on mortgages, about $1.5 trillion on vehicle loans, and $1.5 trillion on student loans. It's a lot of debt. To adapt a quote, this might not be comical to anyone but my children, but whenever this commercial comes on, we uh, I generally joke with them about it. But to adapt a quote from an insurance commercial, if you've seen the insurance commercial, you know exactly which one it is I'm talking about. When it comes to debt, Americans know a thing or two because we borrowed a thing or two. Borrowed quite a bit. We have borrowed seemingly until we either cannot borrow anymore or everything we borrow gets taken by somebody. I remember a commercial years ago. I don't know who it was. I don't know what it was about. I don't have any idea what company it was. I don't know what they were selling. But there was a guy with a two-story house, nice-looking house, not just a, a two-story uh very quickly pieced together manufactured home, but a, a nice large two-story house uh, wherein we may assume there's five or six bedrooms, three or four bathrooms, two official dining. I don't know why you need two dining rooms. But some people do. Why they had two dining rooms, everything. The guy had a great house, a great lawn that was nice and cleanly cut. I'm sure there are some sorts of vehicles in the driveway. And the guy who owned the house was riding a riding lawnmower riding around the, the lawn in his front yard, cutting his grass, and he had this huge smile on his face. And somebody walked up to him and asked him, how do you, I don't know his name, I don't remember, how do you afford all of this? And as he's still smiling and grinning, you can tell it's a pasted, a, a pasted smile. It's not what he's doing genuinely. He said, I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. That's how some people live. That's how many American families live. I want to talk about this evening an impossible debt. What is an impossible debt? Well, there's probably a variety of answers that we could give. Let me mention a couple to you just for reason of example. An impossible debt might be someone who makes minimum wage and who is attempting to buy one of the new $115,000 Hummer EVs. That might be an impossible debt for that person. Maybe it would be somebody who makes $50,000 a year, certainly a, a respectable amount. That individual has been blessed by God by what uh, money they have to be able to live on. But they're going to take that $50,000 a year, and they are in the process of buying a $10 million ranch. Well, that'd be an impossible debt for that person. Someone making $50,000 a year. Now, I've made my own financial decisions. that have uh, Some of them have been good. Some of them have been bad, so people can judge me. Uh, however you would like, based on what I'm about to say, but somebody who makes $50,000 a year has no business even dreaming of making payments on a $10 million ranch. It's not going to happen. You're never going to get all of that paid back. Those would be impossible debts. Our country has experienced a default from impossible debts when loans in the early 2000s were, were thrown out for individuals who wanted homes, thrown out like candy. And many of them simply could not afford the loans that they had taken out for the house, which led to a variety of economical issues in our country. However, all of that debt we can discuss, <clears throat> all of our nation's debt in the however many trillions it is now, if that were to be divided up to each one of us, we would all owe something of our government debt that most of us probably could not pay or would not even be able to dream of paying. All of that having been said, that debt is nothing compared to the debt that you and I owe in another sense. All of that debt is nothing, comparatively speaking, to this other great debt. This debt has nothing to do with credit cards, mortgages, vehicles, 
ranches, recreation vehicles, student loans, or any other kind of debt you can imagine. That is the debt that you and I owe God. The debt that you and I owe the Lord. We sing about it. I say we sing about it. I don't know if it's in this book. Somebody tell me later on if it's in our songbook or not. But there exists a song in songbooks, whether it's in this hymn book or in another one. And the content of the song is, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owe a debt I could not pay. That's the way that you and I should think about the lives that we live to God. There is nothing you and I could ever do to in any way fill up the measure of debt that we owe to God. You know, if someone has a high enough credit card bill and they only throw a couple of hundred dollars at that credit card bill every month, they will never in their lifetime get that credit card bill paid because all they're paying is interest. You know, you and I, in a much worse scenario than that, or in the same way when it relates to God, we will never be able to make enough of a payment to God for the debt that we owe to him that has been paid for us that allows us to stand in the presence of a holy God. Look with me, if you would, at the book of 1 Peter in chapter number 1. It's not where our text is coming from for tonight, but that's where I'd like us to begin reading first. 1 Peter chapter 1. God purchased, or to use another word, redeemed us from the captivity of sin, paying the ransom price for us that is incalculable, that is impossible to calculate, paying this price for us by the blood of his son. First Peter chapter 1, and verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he was indeed, he was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. When we read through Isaiah chapter 53 and all that he was have planned to have endured by God, which when you read Isaiah 53, Isaiah writes it, wrote it, as if it had already happened, and yet he's speaking of the things that would happen to our Lord 700 years in the future from the time he penned those words. And yet it happened to Jesus, just as the Bible said that it would happen to Jesus. He was stricken. He was bruised for our iniquities. We hid our faces from him, Isaiah writes. He comes down. He leaves the equality with God, having been there in the beginning. Well, as we read this morning in Genesis chapter 1, whenever the Bible says, let us make man in our image, the Lord was there. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John chapter 1 and verse 1. Without him, nothing was made that was made, the Bible tells us. Jesus left that place of glory, equality with God, being God himself. Left all of the majesty that you and I can only assume heaven is. To come down here live amongst us. Now, think about this for a moment. Some of you have seen some things I've never seen. Some of you have left America and have gone in the service of our country's military and have seen some very poor conditions. You've seen perhaps cultures or living situations that you might not for a moment even dream of living in here in this country. If you go to YouTube or look at various videos of documentaries around the world. We can find some living conditions of those in which we would say, I, I can't believe that they live that way. It's filthy. It's, it's disgusting. It's, can you imagine? Anything we may feel leaving our clean 1,500 square foot homes with a two-car garages, running water, heat, electricity, and seeing what some of the horrible living conditions might be like in what we refer to as third world countries. The feelings that one may experience going from one to the other, from America to them, from cleanliness to, in some places in the world, squalor. Can you imagine what Jesus experienced leaving heaven to come live with us? Leaving the perfection and the glory and the brightness and the majesty that was heaven to come down here and listen to us bicker, moan, fight wine, murder, kill, cuss, and complain all the time? 
Imagine what that would have been like for him to have lived in. And yet he came and lived that life. Not only did he come and live that life, but the Bible tells us that he was a servant and that he was obedient to death, even the death of a cross, the death of a common criminal. Was agreed to, was obeyed, was submitted to by the Lord. Why did he have to go through all of those things? He went through those things to pay the debt to God that you and I owe for our sins. Next time you sin, I'm not hoping it's not something you jump into, but it's as long as this world continues, inevitable. The next time you sin, and the next time you pray to God and ask for forgiveness for that sin, remember the price that was paid so you can ask God to forgive you. Remember the price, the price that was paid, the blood that was shed, the blood that had never known or thought or experienced sin that dripped down off of that cross. That afforded you the payment so that you could stand before God and request, forgive me, and he would. Remember that. I don't know if anybody remembers the plan or not. The plan, as I indicated last month, Lord willing, we have the opportunity to continue to worship uh, and live together. The first Sunday night of each month, we're going to discuss a parable of Jesus. That being said, I want you to turn with me to the book of Matthew. And go to chapter 18. As we talk about an impossible debt. <clears throat> to add a little bit of levity, lightheartedness to our lesson tonight. Our sermon this morning, the outline was four pages long. We had three points. They were very long points. Tonight, we only have two points. So it'll be much shorter. I've got two points, and, and I, I didn't really know how else to do this. I didn't do it necessarily to make a joke, but it's just kind of how my mind works and how we went. I wanted to look at the text and give us something to think about, something to study, something to chew on. So I titled point one, the meal. I'm going to mention something in a moment that some people might not know. My kids, I'm sure, know what it is. At least I, I would like to think they do. I'm not sure all of the kids here do, but I know that you adults do. But we're going to talk about the text. And then we're going to talk about some application. So our points tonight are titled The Meal and The Doggy Bag. That's what you take home. That's what's left over that you take home. So we'll talk about the application in point two. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. We're going to read through this just bit by bit, if you will. We got this broken down into various sections. And I'd like to discuss this and to study this together as we go through these sections instead of just reading it all at once. I hope this is a text that most of us have read tonight. This is a text that not everyone in here has read. Then please make sure sometime soon you read the entirety of this text. And maybe our conversation tonight will give you some, uh, some illumination into the things you may be able to take from God's word. We're not going to dive every single week into this, every single month, or we're going to dive into the, the definition of a parable. I would hope that at this point, uh, we have discussed it, at least with the members of the congregation who are here all the time. We have discussed the parable at length. We understand what it is. For those who might be visiting with us, though, or for those who, uh, who do not immediately have something come to mind whenever they hear the word parable, uh, in a boiled down essence, we're talking about a, a teaching that Jesus is giving in terms of everyday life that they could understand, but he has a spiritual meaning behind it. That's really what we're talking about here in this section. So let's first look just in verse 21. Peter's question. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Now, to think about where this is in our text, if you'll realize in verses 15 through 20, Jesus had just finished teaching them about how to deal with a sinning brother, how to deal with someone who has sinned against them. The, the protocols that God has given, delivered by the Lord himself, of how we are to express ourselves and go about our business in that situation. Let's not overlook for a moment here in verse 21 that there are some difficulties. It's easy for us to read through this. Somebody sins against somebody else. Somebody else is expected to forgive them. Think about this for a moment. Is it easier 
to point out sin in your own life or to point out sin in someone else's? Is it easier to find deficiencies in your life or to find deficiencies in somebody else's life? How many times I'm curious in the life of the church, has there ever been, I, I, I can't help but think that this had to have likely happened in the days of Peter and Paul because we're humans and that's how human minds work. That somebody brings a lesson on sin and righteousness and judgment and so-and-so says, you know, I wish brother so-and-so would have been here. He should have heard this lesson. What about you? Did you listen to it? Did it mean anything to you? Well, I know sister so-and-so hadn't been here in a while and she should have been here to hear this lesson. Did you take anything out of it other than that? Or just, well, you know, so-and-so needed it. Hey, baby, you're the so-and-so that, that needed it. But that's, that's human nature. How do we know that's human nature? Well, number one, we experience it. We live it. We probably have all, at least even in our minds, done it ourselves. But think about the example that Jesus gave in the first couple of verses of Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Speaking about the human nature that is an individual who has this large beam sticking out of their eye that they want to get the tweezers and take a little bitty speck out of somebody else's eye. That's the easy thing to do, right? To see the problem that lives in somebody else's life, but hard to see ours. So let's think about verse 21 in this sake. It is easy to think about this situation if it's not connected to us. If we're just talking about brother so-and-so and other brother so-and-so, we can say, well, I know exactly what you need to do if you're sinned against. You need to go to him. You need to talk to him. You need to forgive him. You need to pray with him, and, and everything will be great again. But what if you're the one that's sinned against? How easy is it to even want to speak to, to be in the room with, to be friendly with, you know, as humans, sometimes our emotions and our feelings can be can be hurt and they can be scarred, and we might not always want to be on good terms with someone who sins against us. We might not always want to be on great terms with someone who has been harmful to us or who has insulted us. And so Peter is asking perhaps a, a basic human question. Peter indicates here, I'm willing to forgive him for a while, but at what point, God, do I cut that off? At what point do I get to stop forgiving him? At what point can I tell him, sorry, you've done too much? I'll do it seven times. Is that enough? Is that too much? Is that the line? Think about Peter asking a slightly different question. What, what, what might we think about what's happening here in the text if Peter asks Jesus, how many times do I have to endure the stress, anxiety, struggle, and chaos of dealing with a brother who sinned against me. As we're reading through the Bible, this is a very clear-cut, black-and-white answer, right? Somebody comes to you, they say, forgive me. You say, okay, you're forgiven. You move on, and everything's great in your life. But when someone sins against you, there are feelings involved. There's lives involved. Lots of times, as humans, we have a problem carrying things around, don't we? We may lose our keys, we may lose our wallets, we may lose our Bibles, we may lose our purses, but we ain't never lost a grudge. We know where those are. We know where to keep those. So Peter's asking, Jesus, how many times should I forgive you? Look at verse 22 in the answer. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times but up to 70 times seven. Now, the literal answer that Jesus gave, if it were calculated, would be 490 times. Can you even imagine someone sinning against you 490 times? Would you sit on the same side of the auditorium with that person? Would you still sit on the same pew? That person has sinned against you not five times, not 25 times. There's not even 490 days in a year. How friendly are you going to be with someone who has sinned against you every single day for a year and a half? That might be pretty tough. The answer that Jesus gave then might seem there to be burdensome, but Jesus is not talking about a literal number. If Jesus was, guess how we could twist this? If I could find a brother or sister that would sin against me 491 times, I get to tell them, sorry, Jesus said the number is 490. We're done. We're finished here. 
That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is consistent, by the way, with his answer. If you're taking notes, write down Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. In that text, Jesus essentially says, as many times as it happens, if every single time you have a brother who comes up to you and says, I repent, Jesus says, forgive me. Jesus does not put a cap on the amount of times that you and I should forgive a brother or sister who has sinned against us. As many times as someone sins, as many times as they ask for forgiveness, we are under the expectation of God, directed by the words of the Lord, to forgive them. Now, wanting to make this case clear, Jesus then spoke this parable. Read with me verses 23 to 27. We're still not going to look at the entire thing. We're going to continue breaking this down piece by piece. Verses 23 to 27. A heavily indebted man. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Now I want to think for just a moment. I'd like to express to you some numbers again as we think about exactly what this individual owed. It has been said by some that the talent in reference to value was as low as $1,000. That would make this man's debt $10 million. He does not owe one talent. He owes 10,000 talents. There are differences of opinion. And if you go looking online for exactly how much this man owed in today's dollars, the figures you find are literally all over the map. I found multiple answers for exactly how much a talent is, how much that applies to our money. So I'm going to do this. Even if this amount is too much, even if this amount is too high, I want to give you an amount and tell you how I got through this process so that you can at least think about this for example's sake, okay? Think about it in terms of a daily wage. That's what a denarius is. Denarius is a day's wage. And today's value a day's wage is around $50. A silver talent was worth 6,000 denarii. So that would total $300,000. But this individual did not owe one talent. He owed 10,000 talents. So based on a day's wage being $50, and based on a silver talent, being worth 66,000 denarii, which would be 6,000 times the day's wage of $50, and then 10,000 times that, based on our day's wage of $50, this man would have owed $3 billion. Now, I'm relatively confident that if there is anyone, even in today's money, associated with this congregation, who could pay a debt of $3 billion, it would be begun with a point zero 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 so however many other zeros are there. You and I are not paying back $3 billion in debt. That for us would certainly be an impossible debt. Regardless of the exact price, it's been said that the number that Jesus gave would have been greater than the totality of the national revenue of Palestine. So think about then what Jesus was saying. If Jesus is saying that this man would have owed his master, he would have owed the king more than the total national revenue of Palestine of the day in which Jesus lived. Those people would have understood how immense of a sum of money that was. They would have known it was impossible to pay back. We're not going to take the time and go read them tonight, but I am going to mention a couple of verses for you. The penalty for this debtor and his inability or refusal to pay should have been slavery. Write down Exodus 22 and verse 3, taking notes. Exodus 22 and verse 3 and 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1. 
he ordered that man and his family and all that he had be sold. He did the only thing that he imagined he could do. He fell down at the feet of his master and he begged. Having then been forgiven, not given a space whereby he can work on the money, not given an extension based on how much the government might want their money and how quickly they might want it. He didn't say, I'm going to give you an extra two years to pay this down and I'm going to add a little bit of interest to it. It merely says he forgave him the debt. Now let's move on to verses 28 and verse 29 to a likely indebted man. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Now, if you had to be one of these two men in this period, which one would you be? Would you want to be the man that owes 10,000 talents or the man that owes a hundred denarii? Let's say there's a roll of a dice, and you get to be either one based on what number that dice says. If it comes up that you find out you're the 100 denarii debtor, you say, Phew. I, I, I'd never pay the other one back. I, I can work on this one. This one's manageable. However, let's also remember that a $10,000 car loan for some people is the same as a $100,000 car loan for someone else. Just because this individual owed much, 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 much less does not mean that it still would not have been a great deal for them to have paid. Now, as we've already talked about the money, as we base this on a day's wage of $50, and he has 100 denarii or 100 of day's wage, then he would owe $5,000. If you got to choose, somebody came to you and said, you get to be one of two people. Would you rather owe me $3 billion or $5,000? Would any of no, nobody would choose the three billion? Obviously, it's ludicrous. Don't think for a moment that Jesus didn't choose these numbers on purpose. That Jesus didn't make this disparity so fast on purpose. And yet, though he was owed so much less, he was owed next to nothing compared to what he owed his master, the heavily indebted man, the previously indebted man, accosts this man. Grabs him by the throat and demands payment. Now, he owed 10,000 talents and he wasn't treated like that. And yet, he has just been released from a debt. Think about it this way. Let's say that you've got a nice house on a piece of 10, 12 acre property between here and Austin. It's got a pond got a pool and a pool house out behind your ranch style home. You've got a couple of horses. You've got a barn for the horse. And let's say you owe 12 million for that ranch. If somebody came up to you and one day just wiped out all of that debt, somebody from the bank came by and said, guess what? You don't owe anything anymore. But you know, you've got a family member that has owed you $1,000 for years and has still never paid you back that $1,000. Somebody comes by and wipes off the rest of that $12 million debt you've got for that ranch. You're going to drive over to your family member's house, grab them by the throat, and say, you better give me my $1,000. Of course not. But that's the parable that Jesus is creating. That's the story that Jesus is making for us to be able to understand how ungrateful this previously indebted man is and how unworthy he was to have had it removed. You think somebody like that deserves to have their debt wiped out? Somebody like that deserves to have mercy and grace and forgiveness when the first thing they go do is find somebody who owes them a pittance compared to what they used to owe, and they grab them by the throat and demand repayment right then and there? Look at this formerly indebted man in verse 30 and 34. And he would not, but went and threw him in prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servants. 
I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? His master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. Now look at verse 35 and a very clear lesson that Jesus gives. So my heavenly father also will do to each of you. Do to you if each of you. From his heart. I think that part's interesting. From his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Jesus' lesson is very plain and very clear, but maybe not very easy. Now, we could talk about money, and we could discuss this in a financial way, but Jesus presented this in financial terms to teach us a lesson. So we'll look at this second point. We've already run through all of these verses from verse 21 to verse 35. We've looked at the meal that Jesus gave us. Now here's the doggy bag. Jesus' point is personal. It should be personal. We should take Jesus' point personal. He essentially is telling us that any of us who might be wrong, who might be sinned against, who might be offended by, we might be mistreated by our brother or sister. We are the first man. We are the heavily indebted man. We are the man who owed 6,000 times a day's wage and then 10,000 times that. We are the man who owed $3 billion. Don't think about the man that owed 5,000. Don't think about the man who owed the hundred denarii, not just yet. Think about the man who owed 10,000 talents. When we sin, the Bible tells us we separate ourselves from God. The verse that I have mentioned, perhaps quoted, that I know that Matthew Gibson quoted and mentioned last week is Matthew, Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. When we sin, we sever ourselves from God. And at the point at which we sin in our lives, we create a vast chasm between us and God that we cannot fix. We can throw all of the good deeds and the good words in that valley we want. We will never fill it back up so as to create for us a place to walk back over to God. It doesn't happen. Our sin irreparably means you can't put it back together. Irreparably takes us away from God. And you and I know that there is a way back to God. We began talking about that this evening. The money that was paid for the debt we owe was paid somebody who, by somebody who didn't owe it. Jesus came down to this world, lived amongst our filth, offered himself up on the cross, allowed himself to be nailed there with those nails. He'd gotten out of rough patches before. He just left up and gone from rough times before. And if Jesus was capable... In Luke chapter 4, when they take him there in his hometown to the cliff on which his city was built and try to throw him over the edge, and Jesus was one minute and wasn't the next minute, don't think that he couldn't have just stepped down from the cross when they said, come down and we'll believe. He made himself stand there and allowed those nails to attach him to that cross. And he did it because he was paying a debt he didn't owe that you and I couldn't pay. That's that precious blood that we talked about in First Peter. Chapter 1, the cost of that blood is simply not possible for you and I to calculate. But to make a point, I want to calculate. Not the price that Jesus paid, but the debt that you and I owe based on Jesus' teaching in Matthew 18. Okay. So I mentioned before that $50 being a day's wage and a talent being 6000 day's wages, and then he owed 10,000 of those was $3 billion. Think about it this way. If you owed God $3 billion for your debt of sin, 
and you made $50 every day. If you worked for seven days a week, it would take you approximately 165,000 years to pay it back. Now, based on a lifespan, all of us might not even hit that, but based on a lifespan of 100 years, that means it would take you and I over 1,600 lifetimes to pay God back. And that's if we never added a single sin to it. Anybody ever had credit card debt that doesn't get higher? If it doesn't get higher, you got to put it away. You got to cut it up. You got to throw it away. You got to stop using it. You and I, through our lives, have continued to sin. That means the amount that we would owe to God for our sin has only grown and grown and grown. But if at the moment we sinned and were separated from God by our own decisions, we owed God $3 billion and paid him back at $50 a day, it'd take us over 1,600 lifetimes to pay him back. Now, does that change in any way how grateful we are that all God has asked us to do is hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, and he washes that debt away? 1,600 lifetimes. Now, we can't pay God back regardless of how many lifetimes we have, but just for method of effect, just for example's sake. If we were the man that owed 10,000 talents, it would take us 1,600 plus lifetimes to pay that back. The point is, you and I will never, ever, ever, ever be able to pay back our debt. We can worship God for 10 million years in heaven and not pay back our debt. Jesus chose, I believe, Jesus chose an unrealistic number on purpose. Now, why would he do that? Why would Jesus choose in this parable an unrealistic number on purpose? Number one, because our repayment would be unrealistic. But this brings us to the real point that I believe that Jesus was making. Since God has forgiven us all of that great debt, was we're the 10,000 talent man, right? We're the 10,000 talent debtor. Since God has forgiven us all of that debt, who do we think we are if we don't forgive the debt of someone who sinned against us? Sinning against us, we are, we are not in the position of, of God to demand the same types of repayment. We are not in the position to be able to hold someone's sin or sin debt over their heads. We also, though, thinking about the 10,000 talent man, are more likely to act like the 10,000 talent man to the man who only owed 100 denarii. God has forgiven us all of the debt that we ever owed for our sins, and yet someone sins against us, and we, metaphorically, go to them, grab them by the throat, and say, you better pay me back right now. Jesus, we know, wasn't talking about money. Jesus was talking about forgiveness. If God has forgiven us our debt, and he has through the Son and through the sacrifice of his blood, if we have obeyed the gospel, if God has forgiven us all of our great debt, a debt that monetarily would pay, take us over 1,600 lifetimes to pay back, we do not have a moment, an ounce, a scintilla, a speck, a millisecond of time or opportunity to not willingly forgive someone who sins against us and asks us to forgive. Now, it might not be easy. It might take a while before hurt feelings are fixed. We might have some scars that we need to cover over with makeup for a while until those scars are gone. But if God has forgiven us all of that great debt, we have an expectation to forgive others their sin against us. Matthew, Mark chapter 11 and verse 26, Jesus says, if you don't forgive them, God's not going to forgive you. See, God's forgiven us once. God's wiped that debt away from us because of the blood of Son, the blood of His Son. And when we are baptized, that blood washes away all of that debt. But if we go from that point on and we don't forgive others their debt, remember what happened to the heavily indebted man? His master came and took him and threw him in prison. 
The God that has forgiven us debt can also hold us guilty of debt. If we incur that debt by being unwilling to forgive others when they've sinned against us. Let me end the parable on this. I want to end our discussion on this. It is clearly taught in this text that Jesus expects us to forgive all of those who sin against us, regardless of whether it's one time, seven times, 490 times, or 400,000 times. God has forgiven us a debt we could not pay back. He expects us to forgive others their sin against us. And while that is important, and that is definitely the point, one of the points of that parable, there's another point that I want you to take with you. Here's your doggy bag. Take this one with you. That is the gratitude that you and I should express and experience. The gratitude that we should feel and the gratitude we should offer to God for his willingness to forgive us for our sin debt. First John chapter 1 and verse 7 and First John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. Two verses later, John writes that if we confess our faults to him, to the Father, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We are that 10,000 talent man. Do we thank God often enough for his willingness to wipe that debt out? Are we as grateful to God as we should be for the price that he was willing to pay for our debt? The two things that we need to leave with tonight is be willing to forgive those who come to you after sin. And thank God every day for the price he paid by the blood of his son to wipe away your 10,000 talent debt. Each and every one of us owe a debt from our sin we simply could not pay back, and yet Jesus willingly takes it on himself. Are we living in a way that honors that? Are we living like he lived? Because the Bible tells us, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, we need to live like he lived. Jesus gave himself for us, and in reality, God asks for very, very little back in return from us. He asks us to believe in the gift that was given to believe in the church that was established, to believe in the word that was delivered, and to obey the teaching, to hear his word, believe it, repent of our past sins, confess Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God and Savior, and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. At that moment, the blood of Christ cleanses us from the entirety of the sin debt we have ever incurred in life, makes us whole with God, and because the blood of Jesus allows us to stand in the presence of God. If you've not made that decision tonight, don't put it off until it's too late. If you have already made that decision, if you're already a member of the Lord's church, be willing to forgive and be steadfast and active and consistent with your prayer of thanks to God that he was willing to wipe away your debt for you. Whatever the, the need may be of those who are gathered here tonight, the invitation is offered that we can help you come while we stand and sing. I have to decide to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. But go with me, I still will follow. I still will follow. Don't go with me, I still will follow. Don't turn me down. Don't turn me down. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turn me back. I'll follow you. Hey.
Do we have any here this evening that are in need of the Lord's Supper? Please sing your song books to hymn number three, prepare for the Lord's Supper. We'll sing verses one, one through five, and then the chorus. Sing verses one through five, and then the chorus. You have it. Let us. Alas, and did my Savior give and my sovereign die? Would he give that Savior for such a worm as I? Was it? For us that he brought up on the tree, amazing pity, grace on us and love beyond the end. Well, I the sun. In dark, inside, and shining in glory, and when Christ above the men, oh, that the creature will see the smile that lights my life. Sing base while his dear cross appears. Tis all my heart in faithfulness and fell my eyes to tears. But drops of grief can never be Let's pray for the bread. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. You sent your son who died that cruel death on the cross for our sins. He was spat upon. He was slapped, had a crown of thorns twisted upon his head. He was beaten and whipped. And he carried his cross to Calvary. And his hands and feet were nailed into the cross. And he died for our sins. In Jesus, your sons, and we pray. Amen. We thank you, Lord, again for all that you've done for us. You sent your son. His hands and feet were 
nailed to the cross, his side was pierced, and blood and water came spilling out. And he took his and he took his last breath, Lord, on that cross, and he died for our sins. His blood was shed for our sins, and we were undeserving. It's in Jesus, your son's name we pray. Amen. Now we begin a portion of our service that is separate from communion, where we give back to the Lord after giving so much to us. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you have given us. Thank you for today, allowing us to gather two times. Help us give every first day of the week from the goodness of our hearts, from all that you have blessed us with. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Offerings can be placed in the white box in the foyer on your way out. Oh, before our closing prayer, will be hymn number 290. Once you have it, please stand. Let us bow. Lord, thank you so much for letting us assemble today to worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the lessons that we have received, Lord. Lord, help us have some way, Lord, so we get out of this drought situation. Lord. Help the people that who bow and help problems, Lord, please heal them. 
please help me give back to good health, Lord. Well, please guide doctors' hands, Lord, as they perform surgery. Lord, please forgive us for our sins. Lord, thank you so much for sending your son to this earth to die on the cross to save us. Lord, be with the elders and deacons. Lord, please give them wisdom and make them right and help them make the right decisions in this church. And these are acts in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.